Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Rozier. I'm the director of the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and a member of the Villanova History Department faculty. Welcome to the final event of the fall semester calendar, Video Games in Historical Perspective. And a special welcome to our distinguished panelists, Dr. Kelly Wood, Dr. Trevor Strunk, and Dr. Matthew Thompson. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge Albert LePage's vision and generosity, which allowed us to establish the LePage Center in 2017. And I want to encourage you to stay tuned for announcements of spring semester events, which will continue the year-long theme of cities in historical perspective, as well as include special events on Ukraine, baseball in historical perspective, and several informal lunch at LePage conversations. Finally, I want to thank Kevin Fox for organizing tonight's event, and I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, who will introduce our moderator, Dr. Gordon Coomfield. Kevin, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our Villanova colleague from the Department of Communications, Dr. Gordon Coomfield, who will then introduce our panelists and moderate the discussion and Q&A that will follow. Um, please submit a question to our panelists at any time by the Q&A function, uh, which we'll get to answering after everyone's presentation. Dr. Gordon Coonfield is an associate professor of communication at Villanova, where he teaches and conducts research on visual and urban communication and culture. In addition to being a lifelong gamer, he is interested in the philosophical questions posed by non-traditional media and the impacts of such media on collective experiences of everyday life. Dr. Coonfield. There we are. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Rosier and the LePage Center for this opportunity uh, to talk to you all today. Uh, I have to just sort of give a shout out to Kevin, especially this would not have happened without him. Uh, he did all the heavy lifting here. He deserves all the credit for what goes well, and I deserve all the blame for what goes poorly here tonight. Um, as uh, Kevin said, my name is Gordon, and I am an, uh, I'm a lifelong gamer. Um, if that sounds a little bit like a 12-step style confession, that's because it's not far off. Uh, I vividly remember my first hit, the first game I ever beat. I was in grade school. I was playing Adventure on my best friend's Atari console. That was too rich for us. Um, and that feeling of using the bridge to find the microdot, the original Easter egg um, that opened a secret little room, uh, which contained the simple glowing message created by Warren Robinette. I've been chasing that high ever since, folks. And I think a lot of the rest of us have, too. Uh, I still feel it every time I beat that frustrating final boss uh, and watch those credits start rolling and listen to that gorgeous music play over. Uh, my fascination continues to the present. And although I do not publish on gaming and games, I can draw very clear philosophical lines uh, between my scholarly interests in and writing about media and culture and my lifelong, lifelong compassion or obsession uh, with video games. So it's in this connection that I want to just set the set our talk up today with with three sort of general ideas about how history connects here to uh, to video games and to gaming. And I guess the first would be the history of games. If, as Thomas Andrew and Flannery Burke have suggested, history is about change over time, causality, context, complexity, and contingency, how do games as creative, economic, ludic, and technical endeavors figure into historical thinking and historical reasoning. In other words, why should historians care? And I think this will be something that uh, uh, several of our panelists will speak to, but definitely Dr. Wood's work, I think, comes into this, this part uh, of, of game studies. The second you might call history in games. And um, 
By this, I mean the many ways in which some of the most popular franchises have appropriated the past. These franchises with their passionate and fan bases often treat historical material like Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, or God of War. What is important then about games as ways of engaging with historical matters, with historical texts? What responsibilities do we have uh, as players of games to engage them in this way as critical texts? And what does um, what role does scholarship have in interrogating these games narratives, especially when they reinforce problematic? particular problematic ideological positions. For instance, representations of poverty and the developing world. Civilian populations as inherently disposable and uh, if not disposable, at least suspicious. Uh, Whitewashing of historical contexts and actors. And what to make about the West's obsession with non-Western histories in the context of games that are set in the Sengoku and Edo periods of Japan. I'm looking at you, Sekiro, Ghosts of Tsushima, etc. Um, so then that leads to the third question. If we've got the history of games, the history, historical context being gaming context, sites of play, then the third might be a uh, history of games and gamers. Um, Few games are engaged in isolation, uh, and and certainly they're arguably not enjoyed that way anyway. Uh, Connection to a community in a variety of different forms is baked into game development and into the pleasure and the pain sometimes um, uh, that people take in gaming. Whether those communities take on the role of archiving knowledge, uh, that's the whole reason I joined Reddit. It was to figure out how to beat Dark Souls 2. Or things like the wikis that are indispensable to being able to complete some games. Um, These become important ways of connecting players, and, uh, uh, and that collective aspect becomes a very important part of playing, not just in MMORPGs like World of Warcraft, but also in other PvP contexts in games. So what are the important questions we should be asking about the kinds of publics that gaming is creating? And I'm thinking of, you know, notoriously Gamergate here. What role do games and game players have in creating and making culture, not just consuming it? Where do the histories and cultures of such publics fit into our work as scholars? So these are my questions, and I think uh, various of the panelists will have different things to say uh, about some of those. Um, So I will introduce each of the panelists in turn. They'll speak for 10 to 12 minutes, uh, and then we'll follow that with uh, questions from the audience. Um, So if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. So let's start with Dr. Kelly Wood. Uh, She is the Dale G. Cleaver Assistant Professor at the University of Tennessee. Dr. Wood is an interdisciplinary researcher, writer, and curator who combines methods from art history, game studies, sports science, and museology to conduct research on the visual and material culture of games and sports. Her work, which spans from Renaissance board games to contemporary video games, has been published in journals such as Art History, Renaissance Studies, Arliss, and in edited volumes and art magazines. Her first book, based on her dissertation from the University of Chicago, The Art of Play in Early Modern Italy, is under contract with Amsterdam University Press. So maybe we'll be doing this again soon. In 2021, Wood received an NEH Mellon Fellowship in Digital Publication for her project, digitizing board games from the Renaissance, re-envisioning them as playable video games. Dr. Wood has also received a Fulbright, a Crest Fellowship at the National Gallery of Art, is a member of the Michigan Society of Fellows and the Renaissance Society of America. She has also curated a permanent wing of the Qatar Olympic and Sports Museum titled A Global History of Sport, which opened in 2022 in anticipation of the FIFA World Cup. She serves as the College Art Association's field editor for early modern art and as an editor 
of the New Art Examiner. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wood to your screen. I wanted to start by thanking Villanova at the LePage Center, uh, Kevin Fox, especially Paul and Gordon for setting this up and also to my co-panelists, um, Dr. Schrunk and Dr. Thompson. Let me go ahead and uh, get my screen shared. So slideshow from the start and hopefully uh, we can all see the screen. So if you're here to hear about contemporary video games, uh, hold out for the next two presentations. As a historian, I'm going to, and a historian of art, I'm going to start with a question that I'm asked all the time, which is, are video games art? And this is a question that has been posed frequently over the last decade and has had a number of responses that have ranged from satisfactory to unsatisfactory. Largely, while the question of our video games art is not uncomplicated. It lies in otherwise uh, banal epistemologies of the ways that we consider things art or not. So at the extremes, art critics might say that video games uh, lack sophistication or depth of artists like uh, Picasso or Van Gogh, thinking about someone like Jonathan Jones. And on the other end of the spectrum, industry professionals ha have accused critics of being uninformed outsiders and Luddites who have been unable to appreciate the ways in which technology has revolutionized art's expressive potential in the medium of video games. So, in other words, the tangible answer to this question are video games art is in many ways the same as our answers to questions about other kinds of new media and the way that we incorporate them, them into uh, canons of intellectual discourse. So today instead, I'm going to look at the long development of video games in relation to the history of the industries of play in a couple of particular interests, instances and the ways that they have relied upon our perceptions of art and technology over the years. So starting uh, before our century and the century before that, at the turn of the 20th century, a local artist and aspiring businessman named Fusahiro opened up a playing card shop in Kyoto. He initially hand painted the Hanafuda or Japanese flower style cards for himself. But by the 1910s, Fusahiro's company was factory producing legal Western style playing cards for the first time in 250 years. Portuguese sailors initially introduced playing cards into Japan in the 16th century when they arrived at the port of Nagasaki to trade. The Japanese adopted European style cards into new games called karuta, deriving from the Portuguese words called charta, meaning cards or paper, as you can see here on the screen. And this is the, one of the earliest surviving karuta cards. Just as Fusahira would later transition from hand painting cards to mass production, karuta cards went from being hand painted to printed, as illustrated by the wood blocks that survive in the form of a lacquered uh, nesting box in the Kobe City Museum, which is what you're seeing to your left. And uh, what is to your right is kind of that rolled out as if that uh, wood block had been printed. The isolationist policy of the Tokugawa shogunate, which began in 1641, had banned Western styled cards for many years, centuries, until Fusahiro then was able to open his shop and open these new products. Um, Fusahiro's company flourished and it was passed on to his adopted son and then grandsons who kept it alive by innovating its distribution and not only to continue producing playing cards, and you see a pamphlet from the uh, mid of the century there, but also finding new and interesting products for its consumers of play, a mass market reaching from the wealthiest to the poorest. Still headquartered in Kyoto today, from its humble beginnings, that company founded by Fusahiro Yamauchi was, of course, as we know, Nintendo, which has left a profound mark on world culture by, but by producing iconic video games and card games like Super Mario Brothers and Pokemon. Nintendo's production of play has engendered technological innovations that have changed the way people view the world 
recently through augmented reality, um, Pokemon Go. And what you're seeing on the right was uh, me doing that uh, with my students in front of some uh, Frank Stella, who uh, no notoriously plays with perspective and space. Um, so it was a art historical exercise there. Um, and uh, also through uh, augmented reality and through things like um, Breath of the Wild, which have expanded our horizons for our world, both real and imagined. Um, and uh, many of these games still uh, function on the ludological aspects of playing cards like those from the past. So as the history of Nintendo alludes, the study of the past holds significant potential to more meaningfully understand the present. Examining structures that persist, persist over centuries, as with long durée methods, is particularly relevant for game studies, not only because games have remained ubiquitous throughout culture, but also as scholarly consensus in fields like psychology and anthropology often posit, games and play have been seen to be innate and universal to the human condition. Thus, long durée game studies might consider how games have historically functioned dually as competitive activities and medic ones, thus artistic representations of the world. Subsequently, we can see the ways in which games are, to take a kind of construct from art history, a kind of form imbued with content. So the story I'll tell today is one that I think mirrors Nintendo's founder, uh, Fusuhiro, a painter for profit, a man in industry who turned to printmaking, and a company in the business of play, which not only utilized technology, but responded to the demand for games by advancing its technology. All the while, the visible, experiential, and tan changeable aspects of games continue to reify their dual nature, serving as both forms and formfulness to fulfill our demands and desires for the gamic and strategic alongside the ludic and the narrative, ultimately mirroring the very deep human game of life. As Clifford Geertz put it, games show us life as if it were art, a deep form of play reflective of our fundamental systems and structures. So returning to the 20th century, um, we'll start with a different uh, story of industry, which is that of the 1939's World's Fair, which was the first instance where a video game was displayed in a major exhibition. Edward Condon was the Associate Director of Research for Westinghouse's Electric Corporation, and he designed the Nimitrom computer game to entertain the public at the company's pavilion. A digital computer connected to rows of light bulbs, as you see on the left, joined other installations that emphasized the wonders of Westinghouse's innovations. Among these were new store-ready products such as electric dishwashers and publicity stunts such as on the right, Electro, a life-size robot that could uh, talk to the audience. The inventive design of this pavilion created the perfect environment to display commercial projects as technological achievements for advancing human life. <laughs> Promotional materials for the pavilion, including the comedic but moralizing hour-long film, depict the imaginary Middleton family, the exhibition's ideal visitors. The plot centers on the romantic exploits of their daughter, Babs, much to the chagrin of her parents. Um, she brings along her out-of-touch paramour, Nicolas Makarov, who's a European-style bow-tie-wearing art professor. Oh, the horror. But in the nick of time, uh, the family's young, handsome friend, Jim Treadway, an all-American hero who works for Westinghouse, defeats his foil's snobbish critiques of the exhibition as a temple of capitalism by pointing out how the innovations of Westinghouse's products will benefit the working man. And in the end, the earnest Treadway rescues Babs from her ill-guided and worrisome dalliance away from science to art. And the film closes with them arm in arm, admiring the marvels of modern industry and imagining a happy domestic life made possible by Westinghouse. Now, far from an outlier, Westinghouse's pavilion set the tone for using games to showcase the advances of industry in subsequent early exhibitions. The Canadian National Exhibition of 1950 featured Birdie the Brain, a tic-tac-toe computer game built by Joseph Cates to demonstrate the technology of new tube display. Across the pond and on your right, 
um, on the centennial of the Great Exhibition of 1851, the Festival of Britain attracted huge crowds who were eager to experience the new uh, founded progress. And the Exhibition of Science in South Kensington invited visitors towards a final section uh, uh, geared towards research in a more leisurely way. This included the opportunity to play a game on the Nimrod, a quote, electronic brain built to showcase the Ferrante computer, who was the, which was the first commercially available computer offered later that very year. Unlike Westinghouse's earlier Nimitron, which Condon had specifically devised for the purpose of entertainment, a pamphlet emphasized the scientific and practical importance of the Nimitron rather for its use as a game. And this is what you can see here. It may appear that in trying to make machines play games, we were wasting our time, but this is not true as the theory of games is extremely complex and the machine that can play a complex game can also be programmed to carry out very complex practical problems. It was precisely the supposed value of the new computer technology for complex problems of scientific research that supported the US post-war military industrial complex and would ostensibly foster innovation and dissemination of things on a popular level. And for, it's for this reason that the DEC Corporation donated a P1P computer to MIT. What they ended up with in 1962 was, of course, Space War, um, a, a subroutine that was uh, used on a cathode ray and uh, was con uh, shared across the country uh, in code uh, through different code libraries. What we know and is familiar to most people is what happens in the next part of the story, wherein the commercial viability of video games dominated the market for technology in the 70s and 80s. As a fierce competition among companies like Apple, Atari, Intellivision, ColecoVision, Commodore, Nintendo, and Sega fast-tracked the development of processors and graphics in the 8 to 64-bit era. But the development of video game technology in the 20th century, in fact, mirrors the development of another game and another technology from the Renaissance, which is playing cards. Uh, the computer is to this century what printing was to the 16th, Brian Sutton Smith said. Yet it might be useful to reconceive the idea that the, the adaptive problem to which video games is a response is the computer might be the same way that playing cards were indeed not just a response to new technology, but rather a driver for technology, the development of printmaking. It's often been conceived that piety and paper have been drivers for the development of print. And the last category has been considered to potentially be playing cards and their, the demand for them as a new form of entertainment, which had entered Europe in the 13th and 14th centuries. We know that um, uh, the printmaking process uh, developed uh, and uh, expanded print uh, technology. Long uh, decades before Gutenberg's printed Bible, we have the master of the playing cards, Queen of Flowers, which uses a multiple plate technology for the suit of the card and for the queen itself uh, in order to uh, expedite and make faster the printmaking process because of the demand for playing cards. Um, and we know that uh, the development of these playing cards was not universally easily received. As San Bernardino of Siena recounted, there was a, an artisan named Bolesio from the city of Bologna, who, um, where there was a new playing card industry, who Bernardino uh, impelled to stop making playing cards as this was, quote, a devil's breviary and uh, exhorted him to make religious images instead. Uh, much like uh, protestations that games were a side effect of computing or in Westinghouse's uh, instance, a demonstration of more important social and domestic impacts of technology. And uh, Valesio, this artisan from the 15th century was worried he'd lose his profession. Now, what turned out to be happening is that card makers um, did uh, 
uh, accede to uh, San Bernardino's uh, exhortation to make religious images, um, but they didn't stop making playing cards. Instead, they uh, continued this industry and uh, playing cards became one of the most important uh, aspects of popular culture uh, throughout the next four centuries. And Bernardino himself, even though he did it in a moralizing way, recognized aspects of this game's potential to reflect deep parts of the human condition. The very suits of the playing cards that he mentions uh, reflected aspects of um, the self spades for cutting yourself, baton, and that's the one on the left, batons for beating yourself, coins here for avarice, and cups for drunkards. So while these are ill aspects of the human condition, cards themselves in their suits, and these are European suits, not the, the suits that we're uh, familiar with much today, um, uh, were an aspect of the game that made them um, poignant for people who are using them and playing with them. So in a way, it demonstrates how artworks reflected the human condition. Now, the maker of these playing cards was Domenico di Francesco di Padua. Um, and he was called by one of the great critics of the time, um, uh, equal to Michelangelo in his sculptures or paintings. And uh, Aretino said of these playing cards that would have been ones that survived would have been um, filigreed in, or um, de depicted with silver and gold and designed with painted figures that would ignite the desire of the eyes of their both holders as much as a fresh jug of water would tantalize the ill. So even as much as every Florentine who is cited would, might gaze upon Michelangelo's celebrated sculptures, the Paduan's playing cards were the artwork most likely to be in the hands, homes, and taverns of, quote, the blessed populace beholden to this kind of merchandise. So over the course of the next centuries, the game of life would be enabled by the technology of printmaking, the diagrammatic surface of the board standing in for life's fortunes and follies. And what we see here from the left moving forward is uh, one of the earliest uh, race path games made up, uh, from printmaking technology coming out of that tradition of playing cards. In the center, um, the new game of human life in 1790. And then finally, in 1960, many of you might recognize Milton Bradley's game of life. Milton Bradley owned the first color lithography free lithography press, and that actually was a printed game in the century before. So coming together between technology and industry in order to create these games. Now, returning to, uh, to conclude in the 20th century, in 1988, the rapid popularity and increasing visual sophistication of video games caught the eye of Rochelle Sloven, who was director of the then newly opened Maria Museum of the Moving Image. And in 1989, she co-curated the first exhibit dedicated entirely to video games called Hot Circuits, a video archive. 20 years later, she would describe how fundamental connections between form and content circuits and graphic style inspired her exhibition. Quote, technology became both the enabling force and the content of the games. This was a very useful orientation for the museum because as we meant it, to show technology affected the content and technique of the entertainment industry was central to the purpose of the game. And in his essay for the opening of the exhibition, the poet Charles Bernstein employed a time-tested conception of art as divorced from utility in favor of pure aesthetics to describe these games. Quote, liberated from the restricted economy of purpose or function, they express the inner non-verbal world of the computer. Rather than exemplifying a rupture between science and art, video games supposedly point to the artfulness of technology itself. Thus to end, if we think about the very institutional situation of video games between technology and aesthetics, industry and design, and places show video games at the fulcrum of art's ongoing and living history, unimpeded by reductive and outmoded definitions of art employed in either conservative criticism or industry skepticism. 
responses that defensively deride the analog history of art as irrelevant to the values that video games bring to a digital future, betray the ways that both sides have fallen victim to the same false dichotomies of art and technology, culture and industry. These kinds of dichotomies, which were purposefully evoked by Westinghouse's fictional engineer Jim Treadway and art professor Nicholas Makarov. The 80 year record of video game exhibitions and our engagement with them not only reveals the problematic and polemical roots of this divide between art and industry, but also might chart the course of new struggles to reconcile false and motivated binaries between arts and STEM. Recognizing the ways in which art and science have been uh, pitted against each other in questions like are video games art can potentially open new spaces for collaborative strategies as video game thinkers, theorists, and makers continue to find themselves uh, interested in asking why these games of life are so relevantly put to us through this medium. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Wonderful. I cannot wait to ask some follow-up questions um, about all of this. Um, our next speaker, however, um, will uh, occur in the, mean, in the meantime. Um, Matthew Thompson is a lifelong gamer uh, whose interest in game audio have become a major component of his work, particularly on video game, piano performance, and pedagogy. Uh, over 1,000 students have taken his groundbreaking video game music course at the University of Michigan, and this course provided inspiration for a co-authored chapter in Teaching the Game. In 2020, Dr. Thompson released the world premiere recording of For the Piano, a solo classical piano work by Halo and Destiny composer Marty O'Donnell. He has presented at the North American Conference on Video Game Music, and in 2018, Dr. Thompson chaired and presented for the first ever academic Ludo Musicology Sound Studies track at Game Sound Con, a heretofore exclusively industry-based conference. Thompson won a grant to create the first ever collegiate studio for pianists, pianists pardon me, uh, studying video game piano, which included having Dr. Martin Lung in residency. Um, he performed with Dr. Lung uh, a series of game duets, um, I believe for the first time. Dr. Thompson has written book reviews for the American Journal of Play and maintains a blog at videogamemusicnerd.blogspot. Dot com. Thompson is currently writing a book titled Press AB, or is it A flat? The text is ambiguous. A, a flat. That was a, that was on purpose. <laughs> aha, aha, clever man. Uh, it's it's typography um, challenged uh, iPad problem here. I think um, the video game piano phenomena. Let me try that title again. Press A flat. A sharp to play the video game piano phenomena. I love it. I want to hear more about it. Uh, he will have to clarify that title significance for us, but please welcome to your screens, Dr. Matthew Thompson. Thank you. I'm grateful as I'm going to start sharing my screen here to Villanova for the opportunity to present. And um, I am really excited about today. So I'm going to jump right into it, and I'm starting my timer, so I'm certain not to go long. Um, it was an interesting request for me to get this uh, question about uh, video games in historic perspective. When you're thinking about sound and music in video games, the main thing that changes through time is that technology allows for the possibility of advancement in what a ga game can sound like. And that is the driving force behind what I'll say today, but I have some different vantages to put on it. So briefly, that was a wonderful introduction that Gordon gave for me. Um, I earned my doctorate in collaborative piano. I'm assistant professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I do half um, voice things like diction and art song and opera workshop, and I'm a vocal coach. And then I teach a lot of outreach 
things. That's the other half of my life. Engaging performance is like a live performance appreciation class, which is just about to have its 10th anniversary. I'm coming back with the first co-teacher who made it up with me and my very popular video game music class. And I am working very hard on a book. Press A flat to play. Um, I also like the A-B combination. A flat comes because uh, there's a particular piece, Dearly Beloved, that said Kingdom Hearts. That makes an excellent piano piece. I've played it many times in concert. So that was how I chose that particular um, thing, plus the A and the B buttons. And if you looked at me on social media, you'd think I was a professional chef, I hope, because I have a lot of cooking things. Here is a little bit of a snippet of a performance with video game pianist Martin Learn. We are playing the ending to Super Mario World in duet. That video comes from a year where I had an experimental studio of pianists working with me exclusively on um, video game music. And I leave it there to show that video game music has gone into teaching studios and performance halls all around the world. So enough about me. Let's get on to the game audio. Now, I knew Kelly was going to be part of this panel, and so I wanted to include this slide, um, which has to do with the origins of game audio. If you think about game audio, it is as old as time. I grew up in the southern United States, and we played games Duck, Duck, Goose, Marco Polo. Those games have a component that takes audio, and it's a critical you, – you can't play Marco Polo without you know the, the audio – portion of it if you know that games um but if you start to talk about electronic games the first games that have sound are pinball machines and gambling machines and they come around about 1892 but if we're talking about devices that have a video screen video games then we hop forward especially if they have an audio component other than the sound of maybe buttons being pressed or the computers working them that um take us into the 1970s. One of the most famous early games of all time, unquestionably, is a game Pong. And here I have a little bit of a clip from Al Alcorn, who created Pong. And this is from a, a Discovery Channel documentary. And he is discussing the audio and how he created it for the game. Off. And soon the Pong prototype that would change the commercial video game industry was ready. Gotten the game to where it played pretty well. Nolan said it had to have sound. And he said, I wanted to have, he says, I want to have the sound of a crowd approving. And somebody else said, I want to have hisses and boos if you lose. And I'm thinking, I, I have no way idea how to make this at all. I'm already way over my budget. I got too many chips in this thing as it is. So I simply poked around with a little audio amplifier in the circuit and found tones that sounded about right and wired them in. It was less than half a chip to put those sounds in. And I said, that's it, Nolan. Those very iconic, uh, nostalgic beeps and boops. There are two things I want to point out and particularly highlight based on what um, Al said there. One is they had already gotten the game to where it played pretty well. And then they added sound. They decided it had to have sound. So it was already functioning. The sound was kind of an afterthought. And the other thing is that um, they wanted to have the sound of crowds cheering if you're doing well and hisses and boos if you lose, but that was too complex for the technology at the time to allow. So it's that development through time. We are at a place now where the games can react, and that's where I'll end my lecture this evening uh, showing examples of how they react. 
One other thing I love to do is to play some different examples of music through time. If I had more time, I would play you four or five of these. But for right now, I want to focus on just two, the Super Mario Brothers underground theme. I'm thinking many of us uh, know this. And these two examples are 32 years apart, but they give you a good idea of the progression that audio has made. So here is the original one, which is created through digital synthesis on the uh, Nintendo. Just a short 13 or 14 seconds long. And I'll contrast that with a more modern version of that in the Super Mario Odyssey, which has perhaps real instruments in it, but certainly much more sophisticated sounds in general, as you'll immediately hear. It's also made much longer because we're expecting to be on the level for a longer time period than, uh, you know, in the olden days. Many more repetitions of that first phrase, the antecedent, before we get that finishing up consequent is what we call it in music phrase. Now, I love to do this with many, many pieces, and I can do it with many of the Zelda things and the Mario things. Um, but this uh, Koji Kondo, who created the audio for the Super Mario Brothers, um, was a fan of jazz and um, jazz fusion. And this is an album that came out in 1979. could do that with many of your your favorite tunes from some of these games uh, uh, amazingly and uh, you know Co Kondo is like every great composer you borrow a little bit from here and there and, and you create your own but no music is created in a vacuum and, and these composers are influenced by what they like and enjoy so one of the things that's kept me interested in game audio for all these years is the fact that gameplay is non-linear and audio music is linear and what I mean by that, you know, gameplay, we don't know how long a player might be in a particular room. We don't know, you know, if they might go up or right or left or depending on, you know, what their thoughts are, what the options are. And music, you know, it's intro, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus up a half step. Over. You would never have that jumbled up. You know, you don't put on the radio and suddenly hear your favorite song in a different order. And yet video game music can expect that and can do that for us. So these days, um, games react, you know, how a player plays. An early example of this that is an easy one to hear is from Super Mario World. And I always ask the question, do you notice what happens to the audio when Mario jumps on and off Yoshi? <laughs> Bye. 
hopefully you can hear there that there's an added percussion track. We call that vertical layering. And they also do move around the parts of the music in the other way I was just describing, um, sort of horizontal resequencing as well, with the intro being maybe last and the, and the chorus up a half step, the first thing you hear. Okay, and for my last two uh, examples, which I'll just play without much commentary, they're each about a minute, and um, I was very pleased to hear Gordon mention Ghost of Tsushima. I love this game. I've played it many times. And this is where we are today. It's what Al Alcorn mentioned from Pong all those years ago. I am playing it in the first case, and I'm going in, and I'm being very um, – Sword blazing. Uh, I'll also give a little bit of, of, of gore and violence. You know, he, he, we're hacking someone here uh, as you play this game. But, um, you know, so uh, and the music responds to the fact that I'm going in and just head on assault. The second video shows one where I'm sneaking around and playing very uh, subtly. And so the sound is totally different. A player these days may hear things totally differently based on how they're playing. And this game took, uh, the, the soundtrack took years to develop, much research people across many countries working together in these collaborative teams. So here I am in the head on assault so you can hear what that sounds like. Draw your blades. Electro <laughs> All right, and I'll immediately follow that up with the my last slide here, which is sneaking around. And there you heard some shouting, some active music. Listen to how different this audio experience is based on my play style. So with that, I will stop. I look forward to your questions, and I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, again, raising lots of great questions. I can't wait for the Q&A. Um, but we have one more speaker left, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Trevor Strunk, who earned his PhD from the University of Illinois, Chicago. He is a podcaster, an author, a professor, and currently associate editor of The Veteran. His work can be found published at nonsite.org, EGM, and his current book, Story Mode. Uh, he has a podcast and a substack under the No Cartridge brand, and he currently uses his prestigious education and fine wit to explain children's books and Mario levels to his two growing children.
<laughs> um, he didn't say enough about it in his bio, but I am currently reading uh, his book, Story Mode, Video Games and the Interplay Between Consoles and Culture. And I have to say it is a is an articulate and informed piece of video game criticism on par with what we're more accustomed to seeing um, applied to literature. It takes up many of the questions uh, being asked about games tonight. Is it art? Is it media? And why do these things matter? How do gamers and game culture emerge and what sort of impact do they have on and the rest of us? Uh, so please welcome Dr. Trevor Strunt to your screen. Thank you, uh, Gordon, for that really generous introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin Fox, for, for helping put this together. Um, and thanks uh, to Drs. Thompson and um, uh, Wood for being here as well. This has been a really interesting panel so far. I will, again, try and keep this as brief as I can uh, so we get some questions. Um, this paper doesn't have a title. It is an idea that I'm working through right now. But I guess if it did have a title, it would be something uh, along the lines of um, space of exception. All right. <clears throat> As this is my first academic paper in seven years, give or take, as um, Gordon pointed out, my my uh, my book is a little bit on the lines of literary criticism. I got my PhD in that, uh, but uh, I've been sort of in the world of popular writing since. Um, I hope you'll permit me a little indulgence as I dip into some theory to start. There are a few places inside the academy that a person can start off with Giorgio Agamben and not be yawned out of a room, and your opportunities outside the academy drop dramatically. So I'm going to take my chance while I have it. Agamben's one of my favorite theorists, in part because he's a quintessential analytic philosopher. He's historically sound, if a little messy, and he uses that rigor to create big ideas that kind of annoy people, but also demand to be addressed. His most famous ideas are bound at the hip, namely the concept of bare life and the state of exception. These concepts derive from a reading of Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality, and for brevity's sake, we'll leave Foucault and his triumphs and sins there, other than, to, other than to say that like Foucault's work on governmentality and biopolitics, Agamben's thinking regarding these two concepts resides at the intersection of the body and the state. Two quick quotes from Agamben will serve to nail down these concepts a little bit so we can move into games, though I'm happy to talk more about the nuances of these concepts or any other theoretical concepts if anyone's interested after the talk. First, on bear life and the quote-unquote homo soccer, or sacrificial man, um, who is banished from society, I'm sorry, sacred man, who is banished from society and cannot be sacrificed, but can be murdered with impunity. This is one of the mysteries Agamben works out in his, uh, probably his most famous book, Homo Soccer. Um, this this uh, legal figure of someone who was banished from society can't be sacrificed, but anyone can murder him without um, uh, uh without punishment and it's always him in the roman but you know any any him or her today the banishment of sacred life is the sovereign nomos which is loosely defined in latin as social law that conditions every rule the originary spatialization that governs and makes possible every localization and every territorialization all citizens can be said in a specific but extremely real sense to appeal virtually as omines sacri because of the relation of ban, and by this he means the ban from the social space, has constituted the essential structure of sovereign power from the beginning. And back to me. In other words, the concept of the homo soccer is a constitutive requirement in the concept of the state's ability to determine belonging as regards the communal protective space of the state. If you aren't going to be sacrificed, but you can be killed by anyone without re legal recourse, Agamben would say that you have been made a non-citizen by the state and therefore are no longer synecdocally connected to its logic nor under its protection. The sacredness of life, Agamben argues, in fact, originally expresses precisely both life's subjection to a power over death and life's irreparable exposure in the relation of abandonment. The inability of the state to sacrifice the homo soccer is reflected in the citizen's own bare life, which is the a priori state of the citizen under the sovereign. And in this case, we could think about a king, but we can also think about the U.S. government as a cer certain kind of sovereign, right? This is just like a, a sort of like top-down leader. Um, this is also what Agamben via Hobbes describes as, quote, the sovereign's preservation of his natural right to do anything 
to anyone. Short and brutish to be sure. But what happens when the state stretches this distinction between citizen and homo soccer to its limit? Well, then we get something like Guantanamo Bay, which Agamben spends his other most often cited text, State of Exception, examining carefully within terms of biopower and the war on terror. As valuable a text as this is on its own terms, I'm going to bracket that larger discussion and instead use Agamben's own definition of the State of Exception as a jumping off point to our pivot to video games. As Gamba describes the lives of Guantanamo detainees, especially during the war in Iraq's early days, but continuing until today as well, they are, quote, neither prisoners nor persons accused, but simply detainees. And detainees for him is, is, is in quotes. It's a specific term, detainees. They are the object of a pure de facto rule of a detention that is indefinite, not only in the temporal sense, but in its very nature as well, since it is entirely removed from the law and from judicial oversight, it is an instance in which, he says, qua Judith Butler, quote, bare life reaches its maximum indeterminacy. Put differently, if the sovereign citizen lives as an instance of bare life under the protection and whim of the sovereign, the state of exception is a space in which the detainee is punished by forced inclusion in the state via imprisonment, and uh, rather where he or she can be materially and symbolically used as a sacrifice while technically still under legal protections. In this state of exception, the citizen and the prisoner are indistinguishable. Effectively, they become an amalgam that serves the purposes of a technocratic neoliberal state, which thrives on propaganda, security theater, and the shifting definitions of humanity. And this is a big deal outside of the actual material decisions of our government and other world governments. Although, in fairness, if we look to Gaza or even to our own ongoing treatment of detainees in Guantanamo, it's certainly enough to care simply about the actual material decisions. But the concept of bare life and the state of exception matter in terms of artistic and cultural representation as well. As an easy first example, uh, consider the recent Top Gun Maverick film. It's a totally fun movie. I undeniably enjoyed it and had a blast watching it with my family. I think it's a great summer blockbuster. I'm not going to lie to you and pretend like I, I had a, a visceral reaction to it. I did go in knowing the politics wouldn't be my cup of tea, but I was surprised to see that there weren't really politics to speak of. Only some cool flying machines and a vaguely threatening foreign nation that was both somehow snowy and performatively Middle Eastern. You can see the backdrop uh, with these these sort of like old fashioned Patriot style missile, missiles. So we're, we got a little bit of Iraq and a little bit of, I guess, Siberia going on there. There was something I didn't know quite how to place about what I found off putting in the film. Ostensibly, Tom Cruise et al. had made a film in which there was no clear bad actor and therefore no race or nationality that would take the brunt of the patriotic fervor the movie produced. However, that vague enemy nation really only makes sense if, dialectically, the well-defined problems of Cruise's F-16 Top Gun flying aces are actually also just a vague positive projection of Americanness. In other words, the enemy nation can be legible as a credible but dehistoricized opponent if its counterpart is also dehistoricized and made into a kind of sine qua non of American values. Top Gun Maverick, then, as part, yes, of being a phenomenal blockbuster film, launders patriotic propaganda by way of a nameless, faceless generality, a space and place that can be acted upon but which can never be defined. I want to suggest that this is a new sort of space of exception, outside the typical governmentality that divines the Foucauldian and Agambian approaches to the topic, but which perhaps has more reach as a result. Culturally speaking, the rise of the liminal, both in terms of the blockbuster film no longer relying on the Russian slash Middle Eastern bogeyman, and in terms of popular culture, see the wildly popular Backroom series, for instance, uh, for like obsessions about liminal spaces, has corresponded with, and in many ways sought to def defang, excuse me, rising political awareness in younger consumers, who get much of their information outside of typical political hegemonies online and via social media. Now, I don't want to suggest the CIA is producing our film and games. Though, as I point out in my book, Story Mode, there's a real conflict of interest when even our most critical games, like Metal Gear Solid, have to consult with the military in order to have real models for guns included in them. I do, however, want to suggest that there is hegemonic pushback to mass cultural awareness happening by way of the removal of space and place specificity, primarily, and here we get to the history part, by removing historicity. 
the most successful version of this gambit occur in video games, though not necessarily from the sandbox games one might expect, uh, Minecraft, Teardown, or Roblox. These games essentially occupy the same space as Mario Paint did in the past, a canvas for creative expression. As an aside, the fact that these canvases are shareable and can be experienced by not just the creator of the work is worth thinking further on. But for the moment, I want to focus on games like, and this was serendipitous because I was able to swap it out for another example in the paper, the recently announced Grand Theft Auto 6 that came out with a trailer yesterday. Long a victim of the Are Games Okay for Our Youth debate, GTA or Grand Theft Auto has never really had a moment where it wasn't a point of controversy or wild accusation. But at this point, even the controversy is a cultural tradition. When Elon Musk is pontificating with conservative bloviators about the deleterious impact of being, quote, forced to kill cops in GTA 5, it's safe to say that even the outrage has become mainstream. However, more than being angry at the violence or the wanton bad taste, both just hallmarks of AAA non-prestige TV titles and gaming anymore, I'd like to look at the GTA uh, 6 trailer with an eye towards my proposed spaces of exception. The trailer opens with, as you see here, a pink neon saturated shot of sunrise overlooking an interstate, a lagoon with a speedboat, and you can see it peeking out over there, um, in a distant city framed by palm trees. We are clearly in Miami, but lest we forget, it is the fictionalized Miami of the GTA franchise, Vice City. The shot maintains the sunset, but shifts in a hard cut to the double fence barbed wire exterior of a prison, where we meet our main character, Luisa who is about to be let out of prison and back into a life of crime in Vice City, or so we can assume. From here, the trailer has the greatest hits of crime fiction and Miami fiction. Beaches, car chases, the Everglades, a rain-soaked gas station gunfight, and most importantly, a passionate plea to, quote, stick together to get through this, from Louisa to her lover, before we get a shot of them breaking into a liquor store, masked and guns drawn. You probably have an idea of where I'm going here. <laughs> this is a compelling crime story, right? This sounds really great. And it's pretty excellent that there's a lack of a specific city so that the typical media members and crime fabulists can't get up in arms about how, quote, those people are ruining, quote, our image. I'm sure being outside of Philadelphia, as I am as well, you have no, you know, no experience in this at all. Uh, people worrying about crime in maybe not entirely uh, faithful ways. But we have a Top Gun Maverick problem here as well. Vice City can mean anything, really, so long as it has the veneer of the tropical and the seedy, which of course means that it ultimately stands in for nothing specific at all. The city expands and contracts as the game needs, with no real contextual boundaries. The dialectical corollary for its making any real sense, as a dehistoricized display space, on the other hand, is the player themselves, who are expected to act as a judge, participant, collaborator, and critic, all the actions in the game. A multi-tiered expectation only possible when void of contextual or historical judgment themselves. In other words, the world of Vice City is able to operate as a placeless version of Miami, with none of the social, historical, or cultural issues that would have to be taken into account if the, quote, actual space were used. But this is only possible also because the player is stripped of context as well. Anything that happens in GTA 6 is not subject to critique or applause of any kind, uh, I'm sorry, it's not subject to critique or applause of any kind or interpretive impulse because any action in the game is delimited by the space in which it takes place. As critics and readers, we have to take into account the historical and literary context of the text we are interpreting. But when all that context is evacuated, what we're left with is not a material context, but a shifting signifier that can only be fun or dull. Any action the player takes can be recontextualized on the fly based on how they feel about the historically adrift world of Vice City. That this approach to a massive, sprawling, seemingly diverse world echoes an ideal counter-protest position of a politics of feeling instead of materiality is not, I would argue, a bug but a feature. The bland, unspecific politics in place of massive open world games are always at peace with the devaluation of politics in general a turn toward ignoring materiality and history for the sake of subjective interpretations of history and struggle. However, video games don't have to be beholden to such a figuration. Indeed, the recent case of the Golden Idol is an instance of how fictionalized spaces and places can remain grounded and contextual without the act of nothingness of vice city or, quote, enemy nations. In the vaguely British, vaguely American land of Albion, Golden Idol follows a series of unappealing men fighting over a golden idol, which has the power to perform some alchemical actions. As the player, your job is to view a tapestry of a murder, search for clues, and use the words you find to fill in a story that explains what is happening to the unappealing men 
and sometimes women you are looking at. So here you see the unappealing people, and here's the story you have to fill in. It, super interesting, honestly. Um, anyway, uh, however, as the story moves on, the idol keeps falling into different hands, people scheming for power, for love, for lust, etc., and eventually an ambitious grifter named, Na La La named Lazarus obtains the idol and uses it to rise through the ranks of a secret society and take power of the nation at large. The player can do nothing but explain that this is happening as it is happening. You get to watch as the undeserving are rewarded, the kind are killed off, and the little people get smashed. And far from being able to watch impassively, you're forced to accurately describe the actions of these openly vile men to continue the game. It's hard not to feel a little complicit, like in a story and instantiating the specific details of these people who should really be stopped before they needlessly hurt others and simply can't be. Unlike the freedom of GTA, the constraints of Golden Idol speak to the very real frustrations of seeing the material realities around you and being entirely unable to do anything about them, despite understanding them perfectly. And in this case, you understand them better than even the people in them. Golden Idol forces a feeling of complicity onto the player, particularly profound as it echoes in a fictional sense the very real crimes of artifact theft, colonization, political assassination, and puritanical subjugations that occurred from the 18th to 20th centuries more than any police murder in GTA could, and as a result, encourages a reflection back onto that player's lived world. In this way, we can see how the video game medium can absolutely eliminate historicity entirely, leading to a consenting subject uninterested in critically assessing the conditions of the world around them. But that also the interactive quality of the game, and this goes back to what a lot of the other speakers, uh, as well as Gordon, talked about in terms of like the, 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 the kind of like feedback uh of, of participation uh in games the interactive quality of the game encourages a feeling of complicity and immersion in the right instances these games pushing back against the spaces of exception and encouraging historicizing impulse even when they do not themselves historicize in reality they can be purely fictional are spaces of potential political value and deserve more attention moving forward as we try to determine the ways games can help us understand and reevaluate the material conditions of ours and others' histories. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and I think that I like that a use of the space of exception um, to talk about the way that games kind of decontextualize um, as a move to give us a pol politics-free space to play. Mm -hmm. um, so now begins the question and answer period. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function uh, to pose it. Um, and I'm going to start with the one that's already in the, in the chat. Um, this question comes to uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, and the questioner asks, when did dynamic music in games really begin? And he, the, he, she clarifies um, what they mean by that is music that responds to the actions of the player. And I think this is a question about when did this start and, um, and who started it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I was able to see that question. I would point to two games um, early on that I often use as examples. One is Lazy Jones in 1984 for Commodore 64 and other systems. This is a game where you're trying to avoid your hotel manager and just play video games and not do work. And as you enter and exit these different rooms, the music, rather than have a hard cut as we did even after that period, waits until a musical strong beat to change so that it's a more seamless transition. And then uh, the other game that I uh, point to is a game by LucasArts, the same people who are making Star Wars and that stuff, Monkey Island 2 from 1991. And Monkey Island 2 has a had a proprietary developed um, audio system called iMuse, and you can look up all about that, I-M-U-S-E. And... Um, if you walk off screen at a certain time, you hear a different musical ending, depending on when in the music track that happened, or as you're going along a path, certain instruments come in. So I think of those as sort of the early, early ones um, to really handle that dynamic situation well. Very good. Why, thank you. Um, while the while the our guests are composing their very thoughtful questions, uh, I wanted to kind of pose one 
for all of you. Um, we have a lot of students in the chat, and, uh, and I'm sure that they're going to be interested in this. Um, I would just for each of you, what do you think is the essential work on history uh, of gaming as you see it? I'm thinking more, I'm sorry, Dr. Wood, but I'm thinking more video games than ancient games. But uh, what, what in your view is like, this is the one thing that everyone should be reading that really sort of lays out what's at issue in the history of video games? Dr. I'll answer, I'll just jump in um, unceremoniously and say, um, I think Jesper Joel's Half Real is essential to any student who is interested in um, understanding the aesthetics of video games. It incredibly well conceptualizes uh, the development of games in our century, but in a way that uh, dialogues with deep discourses on the theories and histories of play. And I don't know if Dr. Schrunk and, and um, uh, Dr. Th Thompson agree at all, but that I found that work to be uh, a, an essential read. Um, there's also a wonderful article by Gonzalo Frasca on the aesthetics of gaming uh, that uh, it can be very useful if you're interested in teasing apart um, ludology, narratology, and aesthetics. So a bit less his, uh, essential for the history of video games, but uh, less, uh, I can tell you about, um, you know, we can go back to Plato's, <laughs> we can go back to that. But in the last, uh, in the last 50 years, uh, those two would be my, my, my must reads. Oh, okay, I'll I'll go. Um, I think the first thing that came to mind, Karen Collins has a number of books, but there's an orange one. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title. The orange would care, uh, Casey, if you're watching this. But um, so uh, that is just you know that was the first person. I mean, Karen, uh, Karen, uh, Casey finished her doctorate, and then the next day was like, this is what I want to write on, and I kind of relate with that. You couldn't study game audio, you know, seriously. Uh, a couple decades ago. The other thing I would say is that the, I, for me, the important thing that we need to do, and this applies to video games broadly, but I'm talking about composers and creators of sound interviews. We, the, most of the people, 85, 90% are alive and there has not been attention on what they really did. It's sort of this background. This is a time to get, you know, first source interviews and things and really document what happened while we still can. I hope that that will be done. Um, I Sorry, I stood up there. I actually was forgetting the name of the book, which is uh, the constant problem of mine. Um, uh, but I remembered it. Uh, it actually is a little different than the ones you guys suggested, although those are wonderful suggestions. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I really like this is not it's a bit on video games, but it's a bit on uh, digital thinking in general as well. Uh, it, it's a little older. It's from 2004, but it's by uh, Mackenzie Wark, um, who I, I really like uh, her work. Um, it's a book called A Hacker Manifesto, um, which I, I will admit when I was I was assigned to review this for electronic book review um, run by uh, someone I, I very much enjoyed working with in college and um, or I'm sorry, in grad school. And uh, I was so worried that it would be terrible. Um, <laughs> Hacker Manifesto just sounds like one of those books where it's like, oh my gosh, it's published in 2004 too. Um, it's really good. It's excellent. Uh, work does a really great job of trying to understand how to write about the digital and how to sort of conceive it as its own theoretical place. Um, and, you know, I, I completely uh, agree with the idea of like the history of games uh, just in general that that, uh, that uh, Dr. Wood mentioned. And also this idea of just like, you know, the idea of first person interviews, as Dr. Thompson mentioned. I think those are really important. And I think one of the places to sort of piggyback on that, uh, if, if we're not talking pure theory, uh, uh, ROM communities, translation communities, people are putting out new stuff that like hasn't ever been touched by Western audiences. Um there's like really dramatically interesting stuff coming out, even in sort of like the, the game Moon uh, on Switch you can play, which is the first anti-RPG. It didn't see the light of day in, in the West until like 2020. So there's a ton of really interesting stuff going on. Don't uh, don't just focus on your releases. Try and uh, try and see what's been uh, dug up recently because you might discover something completely mind blowing. Thank you all for those. Oh, please, Dr. Wood. Can I, um, I wanted to remember um, one more work and, uh, and I'm, I'm 
complete agreement with, with Dr. Strunk. Um, Dr. Uh, Rosworm at uh, USC's work on gaming representation, uh, looking at civil um, uh, rights issues and identity politics and the way that they are represented, misrepresented, manipulated, rhetorically utilized in gaming um, as, a, as a potentially tangible uh, historical uh, look at at this work, and that's a it's a more, it's a recent work. It's in the last ten years. Um, I think her work would be fantastic for any student to go to uh, in this discourse. And can I add one one quick thing as well, just as a final thought? If you're interested in game scholarship, I want to encourage just look up your the game you're interested in in the library search and see what comes up because it's kind of drudgery to read a game you don't know. And it can be so engaging if you have a connection with it. So there's great scholarship. I, if I start naming people, I'm going to make people mad if I leave them out. You know. So, but look up the game you're interested in, and then there's stuff. There's a lot that's coming now. All right. Thank you all. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, how influential would you say indie games have been in the past few years? Uh, and I'm going to throw, a, I'm going to put a, like a little English on this and ask, uh, it seems to me, this is just my reading of game studies, that scholars of games are far more interested in indie games than the general game playing public. Um, but uh, I would be really curious what the what the three of you think about the role of indie games versus you know triple A titles uh, in um, in our thinking about video games and culture. So I'll push back just a little bit on that. Not that you're entirely wrong. I mean, there's like a certain group of indie games that were like almost exclusively the the purview of of critics, right? Um, I think the, the Braid by Jonathan Blow uh, famously was um, shown to be sort of an ivory tower instance where the rapper Soldier Boy played it and just said it was boring and slow and Jonathan Blow had a total meltdown over it. Um, this is sort of the problem you get with like ivory tower, like very, very high, high, high end video games facing an audience, right? Um, however, the I think like what's interesting about indie games is games that were indie that are now not, right? Like Among Us, for instance, the game that like every child uh, plays now uh, was out for years before it got popular due to the pandemic, right? Um, this was a game that just caught fire because of the pandemic. Um, personal friend of mine um, uh, uh, made this game uh scott benson and then his his partner and then his team uh made this game called night in the woods uh which is a beautiful narrative game that i feel had a ton of um play with people who were interested in fan art were interested in sort of like i mean uh, scott isn't a furry but his work really resonated with the furry community i mean there's like this sort of like sense of popularity right within within games there are the triple a games that i think uh, like television shows or whatever are things everyone reads they're the closest we have to sort of a shared cultural event in some in some ways with streaming and all i think indie games um serve to crystallize communities in a really interesting way um harder to codify but things that are constantly sort of like going on under the surface that then kind of burst up and all of a sudden you see you know a spate of metroidvanias or a spate of souls games or you know visual novels and you're wondering where did that come from and it always typically can be traced back to an indie game um indie games you know if their music's going to have a life of its own they have to have a enough of a popular base that it makes sense for that niche within a niche you know of people interested in game music to want to follow that so i'm thinking of of um you know undertale or something like that where there's concerts of undertale and um Wonderful they can be incredibly uh important and powerful in terms of audio that's another really excellent uh example too because undertale's um the sort of like the the, the megalovania the famous song from undertale shows up all over the place like in every rhythm game you could possibly want there's a megalovania level and like every sort of like you know it's always a secret bgm track in popular games it is like absolutely sort of like popped up outside of what you'd expect from like a pixel game fascinating thank you um 
The next question, um, and this is again a question for everyone to take however they like. And I, I'm going to interpret it a little bit. Um, you can all read it too. But um, the 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 questioner asks, whose responsibility is it, or is there some obligation um, to reference or discuss uh, social and political issues in games? Um, the example that they give is Starfield allowing players to choose their in-game pronouns, um, which apparently was a big controversy throughout the gaming community. Um, but uh, what do you what where what what do you think about this? Uh, what responsibilities do developers have um, for the political context that their games are being released into? Uh, I, 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 quickly, I'll speak from the sound standpoint. Um, Will Chang has written about this in a chapter called something like the 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 lion, the uh, troll, and the wardrobe, or something about how female players may use speech manipulators to uh, so that they don't, you know, aren't identifiably female. And it's crazy to me that there's such a culture uh, that there's a consideration about that at all. I mean, I'm a gay man, and if if I could, I tried to make my sim gay back when I was, you know, younger, and I'm playing The Sims, and you had to really go after that guy <laughs> to get him gay because the characters want to be straight. I, anytime you can represent people better, it, it's better. And I guess from the audio standpoint, which is why I'm, I'm I'm here today, I would say what we have to really be mindful of is that. We're being respectful. So that's one of the reasons I like to use Ghost of Tsushima. I mean, they spent years researching and really got experts in the instruments to perform it. Um, you have to do that kind of stuff. It's not okay to – it's not enough these days to just, oh, well, I listened to three pieces of Korean music and now I'm ready to make, you know, Arirang for uh, Civilization VI. That, that doesn't fly. I'll jump in um, yeah, on, on this one for a second, um, uh, because this this dovetails a bit with the last question. Um, I was thinking about the game Phone Story, which uh, I Apple banned immediately because it's a it was a indie game about the mining industry and where this is based the essential slave labor of the minerals that found the basis of the video games that we play on this essential technology that we are beholden to uh, is located. And that was featured in the Victorian Albert Museum had an, uh, an exhibition on video games, design, display, disrupt, and they featured this game. Uh, so a part of it would be, what is the, what is the purpose? Is this a commercial enterprise and, or is it an artistic one? And if, any of the people involved in even a commercially viable artistic enterprise would like to model a world uh, that is um, better, more inclusive, um, and more reflective of our ideals of society, then I think that uh, I hope that there's going to be an emerging and increasing market um, of consumers who would like to uh, use uh, imaginative world building for the world they'd like to live in better than the world than maybe the one that they they live in now or reflective of worlds that we're, we're trying to, to build together. So it's a problem between even this fundamental question of what is a video game? Is a AAA studio produ produce, producing a commercial product that's intended solely to make as much money as possible? Um, uh, or is do we as, as creative producers have an ethical responsibility to make sure that people, you know, I think uh, when we're thinking about search engines, uh, if the first thing that comes up is a McDonald's cheeseburger, because that's the easiest, fastest, satisfying, cheapest thing that we can get, maybe it's not going to bring up that um, that uh, smoked salmon, which might be a little bit harder to get, take a little bit more time, but actually be something and despair, I guess, some, something more nutritious and, and engaging for ourselves. And where do we balance that um, dichotomy of our, of our human impulses in relation to our, our, 
our ethical selves and our our human desires for entertainment, which is a large part of what play is about. Um, very quickly, because I know we're running out of time. I uh, I have a cynical answer, which is that um, these big studios are spending so so much money that almost every decision is based on you know whether they can make it back, right? Um, so a lot of games. I mean, Starfield does that. I have to say, Starfield read the room because Starfield was very successful. Um, in some ways, this is a positive thing. Uh, reading the room and saying like it's going to get me more sales. To uh, I say this is a, is a very hesitant. I say this very hesitantly as a as sort of like a Marxist scholar, and all this is very you know not what I like to say. But read the read the capital right. Like the if Starfield thinks they can make more money uh, having. Um, uh, pronouns in there that probably means that we're we're sort of moving ahead i mean cyber uh cyberpunk 2077 had i mean you could you could make any collection of genitals you wanted um which is you know lewd and probably not what people always want in terms of uh representation but it, you know it's there um i'll also say i find that when games pursue representation in their work it typically is best when they do it and then don't back off even I've, I've i have critiques of the game gone home for instance but um the game gone home if, if, if people have played it or not um it involves a, a, a queer relationship between uh teenagers sort of being uncovered by a sister looking for her sister who isn't isn't home anymore right um and and you know they never apologized for the fact that they you know they included a queer relationship they never sort of like cavilled this is in the the throes of gamergate right um didn't cavil i Baldur's Gate 3 by Larian there's all sorts of stuff you can do in that game that is very queer um zero sort of uh uh even even acknowledging that there's a, a critique so I, I feel like the studios that really include it and then sort of don't acknowledge any of the critics tend to be the ones that get away with it the most and i think that there's there's something there in terms of a model moving forward um and sort of like avoiding bad faith Thank you for those answers. Um, I'm going to throw one at the question as well. Um, and this is kind of inspired by Dr. Wood's remark about, um, about games sort of putting you in situations that you need to learn about and learn from. Um, Neil Stevenson's novel, The Diamond Age, is um, it's about a poor little girl who happens to accidentally come across uh, some artificial intelligence that, you know, turns her into a genius, uh, that prepares her for life in a, in a dystopian, um, in a dystopian kind of sci-fi future. Um, it, that kind of thinking about games as a way to teach us something I think is, um, is really interesting. All right. We're almost out of time. Five seconds, hot take. What is the one game you're going to log into tonight uh, when this uh, session is over? Uh, embarrassing answer, Honkai Star Rail. Less embarrassing answer, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, which I'm working my way through and is brilliant. Brilliant game, brilliant game. I've been playing Super Mario RPG, the, the remake, remaster, whatever that is, and I'm one star away from the end. I'm the lame one at chess.com. <laughs> All right. I'm addicted let's go. to chess.com. I can't help myself. It's what uh it was what relaxes me. <laughs> I think you just out nerded all of us. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm, bad. I'm not good at it. I will say. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for uh, for sharing with us your research and your your depth of knowledge about gaming and game culture has just really been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to the audience uh, for participating in the conversation tonight. And thanks again to Kevin Fox for organizing this and to the lit page center for supporting such interesting work uh in bringing history into discourse with the rest of us um i wish you all a good night and good luck with your various uh gaming projects this evening <laughs> thanks everyone